family mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to, the, to today's APM webinar. Today, our topic will be Agile Change Programs. Let me introduce you to Chris, who will be taking today's presentation. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Agile Change Programs webinar. I'm Chris Ferguson, Director of Novari Consulting, and what I want to do for the next uh, hour or so is to talk through um, a combination of um, Agile program management together with change management um, and recognize the importance of combining these two approaches to delivering change within organizations of a transformational nature. In terms of the change programs themselves, we're going to talk about Agile Program Management, which is a trademark of the DSDM Consortium, so thank you for that. And we're also going to talk um, through some of the contents of the Effective Change Managers Handbook, which is copyrighted of the APM Group. Gaining an understanding of Agile Program Management is terribly important, so we'll, we'll talk about that today. Uh, some, of the, some of you may be familiar with Agile approaches, have used them, um, have had success with Agile Project Management approaches, but the new Agile Program Management approach is subtly different. We'll talk also about change management and how different techniques um, ought to be taken into consideration when delivering transformational change if ultimately you want the benefits to stick within an organization. Um, and Agile and change management, both courses that we and consultancy that we deliver as an organization. And so uh, I'll add into the mix some experience too around um, the impact on individuals within organizations undergoing change. And we'll illustrate how change management principles and Agile work very, very closely together as very comfortable bedfellows. Um, about myself, I've been running projects and programs for 30 years and spent my career really developing and delivering change in many different organizations. Some people call me an industrial tourist. Um, I sat and passed the first PRINCE 2 exam, having contributed to the method. Um, I'm Delegate 007, which is, uh, I think, pretty cool. Um, but I've also led me on to um, contribute to and develop different methodologies uh, over that period of time, including a turn uh, with DSDM. So I have uh, some, some form in this area, but more importantly, lots of experience uh, in implementing change in organizations. Our business I shan't dwell on for too long, www.novariconsulting.com, and that will tell you more about us. But, but in short, uh, what we do is we train, we consult, and we also deliver change. Um, we're accredited by five organizations, so we're delighted to be here with APM today, um, albeit the uh, products are APMG. Uh, in terms of the examinations offered, but we'll talk about that a little later on. Let's talk about what we're here to talk about today in terms of the research. Um, in terms of your organizations, uh, does anybody out there actually measure success rates? And if so, how do you measure the success rates? And I'm interested to understand really what does a good change look like? What does success look like versus failure as the signpost suggested? A number of people have looked at this research in the change management arena. Um, there are th several examples below. Um, Ultimately, success, in my experience, is judged by the stakeholders of the programs you're trying to bring about. And this is quite an important tenet underpinning the success of using agile program management together with some change management techniques. Many change efforts fail. How many fail depends on how you judge that failure or success or otherwise. But IBM reckoned there were four factors that underpinned their ability to deliver change more successfully um, than the norm. In fact, when they actually measured it, those projects that were bringing about change within IBM that used a dedicated change manager, the performance, the success performance rose by 19% compared with those that did not engage. And they had four factors to consider. First of all, uh, really understand the complexity of the change. Don't lob a system into the mix and then run from the support and, and, and continued use of it to try and get the users up to speed, get them through the learning curve. Um, they reckon a robust change management methodology aligned with PPM, which is, of course, what we're going to talk about today. Agile program management as an approach together with robust change methodologies. Clearly, you need skillful sponsors, change managers, and empowered staff was one of their key factors. Uh, and in my experience, the, the, the most ill-educated people in the whole of this around bringing about change in organizations tends to be the sponsors of those changes. Um, but also, they need to invest their fourth factor in appropriate change management education um, and the resources as well required to really bring about change effectively in programs. So with those factors in mind, I thought it'd be worth us looking through um, agile change programs. With regard to a context of change, here's a structure I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, you probably have a portfolio in your organization of multiple projects and programs. The great difficulty is very few organizations have maturity at the portfolio level. 
So change appears to the individual as random and deconstructed as it impacts them through a multitude of projects and programs. Um, clearly that's backed up by governance and P3O approaches. The agile approach in terms of delivery, of course, is um, a project-centric methodology. Now with agile program management, it's becoming much more mature in its program-centric methodology. And indeed, um, whole-scale agile organizations exist as well, who have taken on wholesale um, the culture that goes with agile working, together with the, the techniques and the framework that goes alongside that. Essentially what all these models do, um, and there are different approaches for all of them, is they mess out to a, a lesser or a greater extent the importance of involving people throughout. So if you really want to implement your strategic vision, then you have to um, add to this mix the change management um, that goes alongside the implementation of transformational or vision-led change. So what does Agile Program Management talk about? Its philosophy is fairly fundamental to this, for those of you unfamiliar with it. Um, an Agile program delivers what is required, when it is required, no more, no less. So the principles that many of you will know about in the context of time boxing um, absolutely um, hold true when it comes to Agile programs. But there's a slightly um, more looser structure around the programs that are delivered using Agile techniques because it's recognized that some of the projects within such programs may not be necessarily delivered using the Agile approach, simply because they're very specification driven and that is their, their nature. But the philosophy is underpinned with this alignment of programs to strategy, which you would expect to see anyway, and the incremental benefits. Um, and to me, the benefits are the benefits wanted by the stakeholders. So it links right back to the first statement about stakeholders, they want benefits. And the other thing to consider as well are the disbenefits that stakeholders will perceive there to be when you bring about change. And it's for that reason that you need to fold in some change management approaches to the agile program management approach of delivery. Couple that with effective governance and empowered teams, which I'll talk about in a short while. Fundamentally, that's about the right people making the right decisions in the right place. Further about Agile program management, um, it recognizes the importance of culture in bringing about change because it's based on things like stakeholder feedback, um, a culture of empowerment, um, like empowerment amongst both the users of the changes um, and the deliverers of the changes. Um, incremental change is also easier to absorb than, than radical change and therefore makes it much more, um, uh, much more confident rather that, that, that the change will actually bring about the desired results. People then tend to deal much more easily with incremental and gradual change than with radical change. What that then does is also recognize the importance of people in bringing about the benefits the stakeholders want to see. And it's people fundamentally that deliver projects and programs anyhow. If we look at change management and answer the question, what is change management? This is a takeaway slide for you to consider. Um, this uh, essentially summarizes the content of the Effective Change Managers Handbook, which is fundamentally the content of the course on change management that we deliver. But in identifying the change, think about what the nature of the change is you're trying to bring about and the culture of the organization into which you're trying to bring it about. Um, culture very often drives the way in which all changes are absorbed. You get command and control driven organizations. So understanding the metaphors of the organization culture um, and the way in which organizations make change happen becomes important when considering what the program is. Then clearly you do lots of planning, but how many of your plans actually recognize the need to do change readiness, invest in a change team in terms of those resources? Delivery is through agile program management in the context of this particular webinar. And then, of course, change will only be sustained if the benefits are ultimately continued post the program itself. So you need those reinforcing systems for it. Underpinned all that with stakeholder engagement and communications and change in the individual, understanding what impact change will have on various individuals. And naturally, as you all know, each individual um, is different from the next individual when it comes to their view of what that change may look like. So that's the scope of the change management context that we're going to talk about. And I'll draw on different elements of that as we go through the webinar. In terms of the portfolio of change initiatives that we need to talk about, um, the key points here are really not everything in an agile program needs to be run using an agile approach, which I think is a really neat trick. Um, and the reason for that is there are simply some specification driven things. Uh, building a building would be an example of that, where your ability to use agile is far more constrained than if you're developing, say, a new website um, or bringing new products to market or things of that nature. Um, sometimes also commercial contracts are not at the level of maturity they need to be to handle agile ways of working. 
because they rather fixate on this specification, this scope of works for this much money. Um, how many of your organizations, by the way, have a well-organized portfolio? Um, how many of your organizations out there actually understand the whole portfolio of initiatives? Um, an example I would give, we're working at the moment with a technology client where they deliver projects and programs to their customers and consider that to be their portfolio. But what then happens is they have an internal change portfolio running alongside that customer delivery portfolio and it's the internal changes that provide all the friendly fire that scuppers their ability to deliver for their customers. So it's interesting this year as they try and align the two portfolios in, into one. Um, clearly the agile approach as well um, is going to be one that delivers benefits in an incremental way and so underpinning the delivery of portfolio it has to be the prioritization of benefits at both the macro level as well as within the individual program. We'll come on to that in a tick. We've got five principles. Um, they're fairly well expressed in this regard. Um, the two I want to draw your attention to without reading all these to you but are really the people-centric one. My first question would be how much time and effort is actually spent on benefits identification and on benefits tracking? And my second question to you would be for you to consider is, is can your teams make their own decisions? That decision-making power delegated to the lowest possible level is something that's quite rare to find um, within certain industry sectors. Um, Agile principles recognize the need, therefore, to involve people in making those decisions, in owning those benefits, and making sure they actually get realized. That way, you get the value from investing in all of your change, or most of the value. This aligns with Cotter's eight-step organizational change model. Many of you will have seen this one before. Um, and it's worth reminding people of it um, and introducing people who haven't seen it before to it because it's very much aligned to Agile program management principles and the Agile program management framework. Um, the business of, of a sense of urgency and a guiding coalition to lead that work in an organization then leads on to help create a vision. And without those three first steps in Cotter's model, um, Cotter, by the way, a Harvard professor um, who has done an awful lot of research in bringing around effective change and implementing strategy in organizations. Um, the first three steps here are fundamental prerequisites to launching and delivering any Agile program. Then you need to get the buy-in, and getting the buy-in is crucial. Um, what you tend to find in an Agile program management approach is you have the potential to increase velocity of delivering the change. What you may not necess necessarily deliver is the ability of the organization to absorb the extra speed of change. So you need to strike the right balance in considering an Agile change program. I can deliver it much more quickly, but can the organizational um, draw it in and, and gain the benefits at the same velocity, in particular the people impacted by the changes. So that empowers people to make decisions, take risks, um, and generate new ideas and actions, um, empowering people to get on with the business of delivering the change, creating short-term wins and incremental improvements, very much in line with the agile philosophy of working. What that then does is it allow, allows you to never let up, never let up on achieving the vision associated with the change, but of course you reserve the right, as with any program, to adapt to changing circumstances within the organization. The last thing that people need to see is what I call the Magnus Magnuson program, which goes, I've started so I must finish. Um, you need to be able to adapt because circumstances in the external environment are bound to change. The eighth step in Cotter's model is the culture change, and, and, and culture um, underpins an awful lot of the way in which agile programs can either succeed or otherwise in an organization. Um, trying your first agile program as a proof of concept will be a good way to prove the ideas would work in practice. We'll come back to that a little later in the webinar. The program management life cycle for Agile, <clears throat> again, this is another takeaway slide for you to consider, but essentially it's, it's very much aligned with, with MSP, for those of you familiar with uh, managing successful programs, um, but essentially it's underpinned this entire life cycle by three key things. A very strong, firm foundation centered upon the vision um, and the ambition for the program that's got the buy-in of the stakeholders and the guiding coalitions. The second thing you need is a very strong business architecture whereby you create the business environment into which you can evolve the capability over time. Um, and the third key thing is the benefits focus, as you can see um, on the right-hand side of the screen, the benefits management focus that runs throughout the life cycle. 
and those benefits need to be continually revisited and updated as new ones will emerge over time. Uh, ones that you plan to deliver may not be realizable after all. And the other syndrome that I've seen in, in real life programs is where someone does something completely different to your program and as a consequence steals all of your benefits. An example of this was uh, an early IT system that I rolled out in the client organization, a big ERP solution, where um, one of the uh, end results was to uh, reduce the number of people undertaking manual work to free up time to do higher, higher value added activities. Um, what the consequence then was business performance triggered a redundancy round outside of the program altogether, resulting in my entire redundancy round of benefits being claimed by another activity altogether. So I could no longer claim those as part of the program. Otherwise, there will be double counting of benefits. Let's have a look more about how change then gets delivered. Another thing that Cotter said from the change management arena is, is there's a dual operating system and I guess your organizations are organized a little like this, where you've got a hierarchy of uh, some sort of command and control structure delivering what's termed business as usual, BAU. And then you ask a number of people to get involved in delivering change within an organization. And we're going to focus on within an organization here. Um, that network delivers the change and brings it about. Cotter recognizes the powerful guiding coalition. If you look at the dark blue people that exist in that guiding coalition box, reflect back on the business as usual structure, you can see that they're drawn from different levels as people that exert different degrees of influence and power. What that then does is enable the empowerment of those people who are running the projects and the programs within an organization. And the great difficulty um, comes around business planning in my experience as well. Um, work for one organization, for example, where they plan for last year's business as usual levels, um, and then recognize they're going to take on um, an entire portfolio of transformational change, which would require an additional 10% more resource in their entire organization, resources they simply hadn't planned to have. The consequence of that is quite profound when it comes to agile ways of working, because a lot of projects, I'm sure this is the case in your real world, um, tend to borrow people part-time to deliver some change projects on top of what you might call a day job. In an agile way of working, the unit of performance is the team that needs to come together, join together, and be together for the duration, full time, of delivering that agile environment. If you cannot muster that resource effort uh, in an agile program, then it's going to be a suboptimal way of working that you end up with. This is a takeaway slide explaining the agile program organization for you. Um, the importance here that I want to draw to your attention are really the change related roles that the Agile program environment sets up. It's compatible with the Cotter's model of that dual working that we just had a quick look at. Um, and what you can see here on the left hand side of the screen, three roles with change in their title. First of all, business change owners who are accountable for ensuring the benefits resulting from the program are realized in their business areas for which they have the accountability. Then you get the program change architect who starts to design this business architecture I referred to a little earlier on. Uh, it fundamentally focuses on ensuring that future business as usual um, is based upon accommodating the changes driven by an agile program and therefore the benefits will stick. But then you've got change agents whose role it is to focus very much on the people aspects of bringing about the change. will have a, a close dynamic and close ways of working with their business as usual colleagues because as the Agile program delivers and pushes change into the organization, the change agent's role is to pull into the organization the changes that the solutions will bring about. What that then does is to build a bridge between the delivery of the capability and the realization of the benefits. Absolutely critical to protect the investment and because people deliver benefits, the change agents play a crucial role in protecting and safeguarding that investment. I mentioned culture earlier on, and from the change management um, body of knowledge, see, cultural archetypes, this particular model, is worth considering. And I'm wondering where would you plot your organization against these axes? You get cultures that, on the left-hand side, are more people-oriented, and on the right-hand side, lean themselves more towards a task completion. Then you get other organizations which are, are more hierarchical, command and control, some call it, versus egalitarian, where they're empowering people more to, to do some more self-expression. Um, and, and here I would uh, give an example of an organization which is, which is guided missile plus, where the, the culture of the organization is where everyone's utterly and truly focused on delivering whatever it takes to complete the tasks required. 
and that's probably a good thing but the consequence of that is that they're so fixated on it it results in people providing um, 50 percent plus discretionary effort in terms of working hours a week people are getting burned out a high staff turnover and actually getting a stable delivery team bringing about change in that organization becomes terribly difficult to achieve because of the culture that prevails within the organization the other thing that prevails in that particular organization is where everyone is so busy delivering the day job doing whatever it takes to complete that that everybody uses that as a fundamental excuse to resist change so would an agile program management approach work in that environment coupled with some change management you'd have a harder time of doing that and that's just one out of four of these just by way of giving you an example so what enables governance for me governance is all about taking decisions and in an agile program environment as I'm sure you're aware those of you who've worked in an agile setting it's all about empowering the team to make decisions about the solutions, the products, the, the features and the requirements they're bringing about the change of. The agile program management difference is that not just requirements that get prioritized, it has to be the benefits that get prioritized. So someone needs to take decisions about those. Decisions should be fast and efficient. Capability teams should be empowered to make those decisions and that's all part of the agile program management governance. My question for you is who can decide in your organizations on the following things? And the prioritization of benefits, the prioritization of requirements, and then here's a fundamental thing in any organization, who's empowered to spend money? In terms of decision making, um, this diagram simply says that at the top level of the organization, you'll have a business strategy team, they'll be called all sorts of things, but people running that, essentially that portfolio. And the people running the portfolio, senior managers in the organization, they'll be called many different things um, and many different names, of course but essentially they need to operate as a team and if they don't operate as a team and you get lots of politics in an organization I'm sure your organizations don't have any organizational internal politics then clearly you're going to have a well orchestrated team centered portfolio that's been well directed if you do have organizational politics again that's going to be suboptimal you'll end up with strategies being driven by who shouts loudest rather than benefit driven prioritization what agile suggests and other program management approaches suggest is if you prioritize the benefits that will help evolve the plans and the requirements going forward for your program so your program board needs to operate as a team and then you've got capability driven teams actually delivering the projects and making decisions about the activities they undertake so in terms of making decisions agile suggests empowerment but empowerment to teams and teams need to therefore operate as teams at each of the levels in this very simple diagram what that empowerment means is that um, on the top left of the screen we've got a nice empowered team everyone in agreement with everybody else you can have a, a, a debate about things and an argument about things but you effect, effectively the team unifies around the decision that's been taken whereas as you can see the little model we've got going on in the bottom right of the screen here is where teams have to make decisions but if someone within the team disagrees with the decision that probably starts to disintegrate the team spirit and the team's way of working um, a good example of this as I, I recently at a university uh, ran a series of user story uh, workshops and uh, the user story workshops um, all of the 60 delegates that turned up on a series of these courses were all from the IT department and that for me was a bit of a misnomer I asked the question where were the users given its users that have to write stories about the way in which they wish to see change brought about um, but there we go that's just an example of maybe how not to do it Here's a takeaway slide for you. Um, agile program team roles and characteristics of those. Um, what I'd like you to do or consider doing is to take this away and if you're in an agile setting or you would like to move to an agile setting, work through this list of um, characteristics of an agile program team and tick the statements that apply to your real teams and then work on the things that you haven't currently got in place. Um, hopefully a lot of you will tick many of these boxes because they all go to the hallmark of great team working. What you could do is to apply this at those three levels we've just had a look at at your project delivery teams at your program management teams and at the people who run the portfolio and make decisions at that level I'll leave you to take that away and consider that in your own organizations many of you have seen different models and approaches the change management um, context talks about various aspects of developing an effective team and what you can see here is a simple model of, of how to get an effective team profile going um, and again this is a takeaway for you to apply 
in your own settings? Have you got clarity over the mission plans and goals you're trying to achieve? Does everybody in the team know what their individual roles are? And does, does the team know how to get its work done and what decisions it's able to take? The things that, that get in the way of that are very often the people within the team, the team interpersonal relationships, for example. That becomes very important that the people within a team setting, a, a, a core context of delivering any Agile program, that those team, um, those individuals within the team, sorry, get on very well with each other. In an Agile program setting, Clearly, you'll have multiple Agile projects delivering at the same time, plus the non-Agile projects that form part of the program. So the inter-team relations becomes very important, and the role of the program manager to draw those various teams together and create the right dynamic and the culture within the program. A further model for you is Tuckman's team development. Again, many of you may well have seen this, done this on various management training courses. It's useful because it rhymes, forming, storming, norming, and performing. But I draw your attention to the fifth step, which is the adjourning bit which is where you've done and completed work in a very high performing team and now you feel sorry that you're leaving that team, a symptom that many people forget to consider when forming a new team. The other thing that Tuckman suggested um, was that as you go up to be a performing team, you can also drop back down again. And I was reminded of the team I was part of, we were a performing team um, delivering a number of IT changes uh, in an organization, bringing about business performance improvements and we were really cracking through the work, everyone was turning up early and performing really well. And we turned up early because we enjoyed what we were doing. A contractor turned up in the team who was the most miserable person on the planet and was awful at the contract, uh, the programming contract for which they were, they were hired. That took our team straight from the performing section back down to the storming one in a heartbeat where we spent two weeks trying to get rid of the contractor before finally our boss relented, let the guy go and then we got a new one in and tried to work our way back up to performing again. Suboptimal, but it's all to do with the reality of dealing with people at the end of the day. In terms of the program themselves, a takeaway list for you to, 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 to identify whether or not your programs currently have all of these things in place. Are they all consistent with each other? Do all the stakeholders agree with the program foundation's contents? Um, and essentially, this firm foundation is absolutely required for any program to successfully deliver, whether you're using an agile approach or otherwise. What you tend to find with programs of a change-driven nature is that the future is more aspirational than defined. And that's okay with a lot of programs of change. The trouble is when you try and put together a budget and a business case for those programs and you end up putting together a multiple range of numbers because you're not quite sure yet what the future is designed to bring about. One of the key things you have to consider in all of this is the fourth from last bullet around the key stakeholders and their engagement. So let's move on to consider our stakeholders and the way in which we would need to engage with them. Seven principles to consider, a takeaway list for you again. Um, in terms of the, the key ones for me, I think the last two are critical. People will have an emotional response to the change you're bringing about. Um, it will threaten their comfort zone, it will threaten their, their day job that they're pretty good at doing at the moment and you're going to come in and create all sorts of learning anxiety and upset people. Emotion therefore will trump any logical reason that you can present to people in a PowerPoint. So a lot of listening involved in principle six and understanding people's emotional response. Other thing I found in real life is that um, the emotional response isn't always triggered by the program of change. It can also be triggered by people's real lives outside of the world of work. So the notion in change management is to deal with the whole person, not just the person you see uh, in the workplace. Principle seven is good in that demonstration trumps argument. Um, because if you can prove the concept to people, which is again another agile principle, we'll build something and then once you've had a go at that, we'll build something else based on the changing, shifting, prioritization of requirements, then that demonstration trumps argument. And that's really good to engage with people undergoing change to prove um, the concepts before people actually have to switch over to a new system, solution, or way of working. Agile program management builds on that by saying we need to engage from the program into the stakeholder community themselves. Um, and we also need some engagement within the program to make sure we take proper care of the people working within the program environment. After all, what roles will the people within the program team have once the program's finished? And actually taking care of people throughout the life of the program is terribly important. All of this is underpinned by absolute clarity of communication with different channels suiting different audience needs. 
what I've often found with talking to program managers is, is they often have a preferred way of communicating with people, which isn't necessarily the case for all of the recipients of the communication. So having a wide variety of channels through which you can communicate becomes important. And in these days of social media, it becomes even more important to consider how such tools may also be used, as well as the traditional and more traditional approaches to communications. In agile program management, there is a specific role stakeholder engagement coordinator that drives this which again is a particularly valuable role to add in to engage with the, the people undergoing the change. Things to consider are whether you're communicating or miscommunicating. You may say something and think the message has been received, but ultimately the people who heard it didn't hear it in quite the way you said it. And often that's things to do with barriers to communication, emotional impact that the change is going to have on them, or the channel that you've used. Um, so you need to make sure that the stakeholder engagement coordinator, a particular role or within program management teams, um, this emphasis on communications becomes absolutely paramount, an understanding of the emotional change that people undergo. In change management, that emotional response to change was explained by Kubler-Ross, who did a lot of analysis of when people hear shocking news, fundamentally centered on things like grief. And again, I'm sure many of you have seen this curve before, the various emotional states that people go through when hearing um, news for the first time about a change. Um, if a change is to do with it, you're, you're going to have a new job and, or new, a new system or change offices or whatever it may be, clearly those emotional states people will go through at that point in time. Without reading those to you, what I tend to find is that program teams work on building a firm program foundation um, and, and they themselves reach a, a state of, of problem solving, number seven on the change curve on the right hand side. And they feel engaged with their own change they're trying to bring about within the organization. And it's at that point that they announce it to everybody else. And on hearing the change for the first time, everybody else is going to be in state number one, shock, followed by denial, followed by some anger. They'll certainly be at that end of the change curve. And understanding that emotional gap is really important for program managers uh, in any environment to, to, to realize. Um, I was asked recently about frequently asked questions. I'm sure you've all come across these. We've announced some frequently asked questions. And the trouble is when you announce a change, the day you announce it, you send out 25 questions that you've been asked. People say, who's asked you all those questions? And why are we the last to be consulted about the change? So you have to really think this through carefully and deal with the emotional aspects of that. For some people, this curve is going to be very short and very shallow. For others, it's going to be very long and very deep. Everyone's an individual and we go through the curve at different speeds and so forth. Your, your challenge as a program manager in this environment, as a change manager, is to try and help people along that curve as best as you are able, depending on the consequence of the change for the individuals impacted by it. So having considered that, we can build a plan for the program. And in an agile program management environment, um, Time is fixed, so we always deliver what is required and when it is required, no more, no less, back to that fundamental philosophy. But it also means that whilst I fix time, the future content of later tranches in the program um, could be fuzzy. It's, uh, it's not clear. You do some fuzzy planning and you set some broad parameters as to the future capability without pinning down precisely how much it's going to cost um, necessarily and who's going to be involved in delivering it. What you will tend to do in a program um, is to prioritize the benefits you want to see brought about within those timelines. And that benefit prioritization is absolutely crucial. But it means that fuzzy planning is the order of the day. So how does one prioritize benefits? Forgive me, I've lost my page. I'll come back to the next one. Um, in terms of bringing about this change, there are some people who have different learning preferences. Um, and this table sets out the approaches that you can take to dealing with people who have these different preferences. And this is based on Honey and Mumford. Um, there are people who are theorists who, who, who like to know about the bigger picture and why the change is important. There are people who are pragmatists, they've got practical workshops and all the rest of it going on. People who are activists um, who will basically do on the job learning by trial and error. Um, and then the reflectors who like a lot of information. Um, I was helping a change program in a major police force in the UK and we analysed 120 people in the department impacted by the change that was being brought about. What we then concluded was that about 80% of the people in this particular department um, were hugely reflectors. 
which meant they needed a whole load of data and information to absorb and understand about the change before accepting it. Often this is perceived as resistant to change, whereas in reality it's just that they want to reflect a great deal before absorbing the change into their own way of being and working. So with that in mind, uh, the recommendation was uh, to the people directing this particular program to give these um, people the 80% that were massive reflectors um, a lot of information about the program. Regrettably, as they could not do that, the one thing reflectors then do is they fill the gaps in information with things that they invent themselves, which then creates a whole load of rumors about a program which really needs to be taken into consideration. The key takeaway from this particular example would be you have to have something in your communications plan for everybody. And you may have a particular preference yourselves, these aren't strengths and weaknesses, they're preferences, um, and try and uh, avoid just utilizing your own preferences and try and get a balance in your communications where there's something in it for everybody. And there's some suggestions in the table as to the things you might like to introduce to help with the communications and engagement. So we talked about prioritized benefits and they, they will bring about priorities around the capabilities that need to be pulled together in order to achieve those benefits within the timeline set for the program. And benefits will be wanted by the stakeholders you've engaged with. Hopefully by now you'll have overcome some of the emotional context in which those stakeholders are trying to struggle with the change they're bringing about. Um, and the teams themselves need to be highly effective teams and well empowered to deliver those capabilities in the future. In terms of what drives that structure and the programs and the tranches within the program, the key difference between Agile program management versus Agile project management is that Agile project management focuses on prioritization of features and requirements using Moscow analysis, must have, should have, could have, won't have this time. Whereas Agile program management, the prioritization here is centered upon the benefits the program must bring about. Um, there are must-have benefits at the program level, should-haves, could-haves, and the won't-haves recognizes it is a benefit, but it's questionable. Um, you do find sometimes, I'm sure you find this in the real world, that, uh, that people sometimes overstate the benefit that is needed by, uh, to be brought about, or they overstate the degree of risk that the program is attempting uh, to deliver against. So we have to bear these factors in mind as well. Clearly, within a tranche, um, each of the tranches, therefore, has another set of prioritization criteria around the must have, should have, could have, and won't have. Which team should prioritize these benefits, and how easy is it for the team to prioritize the benefits? The other factor to consider here are the disbenefits associated with bringing about change. Because whilst we do want to see benefits, we should also acknowledge sometimes the change will bring about some disbenefits. And so in the real world, considering both those aspects would flavor this particular table of prioritization. And it's for the program team to prioritize at a high level. That relates then back to benefits management. In terms of the structure, um, Jenna come, has come up with a benefits management model here. It's more of a takeaway slide than anything else. Um, you can see uh, along the bottom there are seven pillars underpinning that in terms of key principles. But understanding what the end goal is in mind is absolutely critical. Then making sure you identify, review, realize, and plan. My key question here as a takeaway slide for you is how much effort do you put into justifying the program in the first place, getting the money for it? And how much effort do you then put in place and plan for um, to track the realization of benefits and actually measure that it's been brought about? And the trouble with benefits is that you get benefit forecasting and bias within people. Um, people have an expectation. Yeah, they select evidence confirming the existing beliefs and evidence, even if something's staring them in the face to the contrary. Or it may be that the business case is framed so that it does get justified, despite the truth of the matter being somewhat different. Um, also, the track record may have been bad in the past. There's an assumption that this program will succeed. Um, and initial estimates are often weighed down and pinned on to the program even though they change and evolve over a period of time. So here are four factors for you to take away, consider around benefits forecasting. So we've got our Agile program, we're underway, there are the normal gate controls in place here. Um, and the program manager fundamentally, as it said in the, the text on this slide, needs a facilitating approach. Yes, there are some gated controls and some reviews that take place, but, but facilitating this approach would be particularly important. In terms of controlling the program, um, I see an awful lot of programs at the moment 
where everything's reported in red, amber, and green. And it always bemuses me how these colors are interpreted within different cultures. I worked on one program where red was seen as you're going to get the sack if you report your program as red. I worked in another organization where red meant that the sponsor of the program, the senior responsible owner for the program, had to do something. And I couldn't see two contrastingly different cultures as how to deliver a program. Whereas in the first context, people hid the problems. In the second one, they surfaced them and they were resolved and the program was unblocked and able to deliver. So the Agile program management transition we need to talk about very briefly. Some key roles here around the business change owners. They'll bring about the benefits that the new capabilities will help to drive. And the transition of those capabilities into the business is critical. The change agents that bring about those, they'll assist to implement process organizational changes as required to realize the benefits. And it's really important to get those key roles embedded in an organization and populated in terms of a program structure. Investing in those resources as well as the project managers and the agile teams delivering the work and building that capability is crucial. Bridges in change management circles came up with this um, analysis of how people undergo change themselves. And when you basically announce a change that letting go of the old ways and the old identity that people had is, is the business of ending. And then Bridges coined a term called the neutral zone, where we're sort of underway in the program and we're trying to deliver these new beginnings. Now in an agile structure, people spend less time in the neutral zone and embrace new beginnings in a more rapid fashion. However, the neutral zone, if it's allowed to go on unchecked and for too long, um, will result in people feeling demoralized and business as usual performance will start to suffer as a consequence of people becoming nervous about the change they've got to bring about. Another useful model for the change agents in an agile program to consider. So in conclusion, successful agile change programs um, need to draw in both an agile approach to working um, an Agile program framework is a particularly good structure for that. And a change management as well, which then brings into much more the people management aspects of bringing about change, winning hearts and minds. And the two are mutually compatible. When you bring them together, you improve delivery performance. IBM found that improved by 19%. But what you need to back that up is the culture within which that can succeed. You also need to have empowered teams making decisions locally, and you also need to have the resource approach to the programs that allow for those teams to flourish and deliver the change. You need to also invest in the change management aspects of the program, not to be underestimated when it comes to funding and structuring the program themselves. Finally, I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to open up now to questions. This slide contains a number of takeaways for you to have a look at. If you have any questions you'd like to follow up directly with Novari Consulting, inquiries at novariconsulting.com um, will get you in touch with ourselves. The APM clearly have websites there. And we've put in Agile and Change Management, um, the qualifications, and also a little bit, as is so crucial in an Agile program environment, around team building, a, a couple of fun things to go watch in all the spare time I'm sure you've got. I'd like to thank you very much indeed for uh, your, your time in listening today. I'll take any questions that people have got right now. Okay then, so the first question that we've got coming in is, can you describe Agile in three words? Well, that's a great question. That puts me on the spot somewhat. Um, I was at a recent Project Challenge um, exhibition talking about a similar subject, and someone asked me the same question. So thank you for asking it again. Um, Agile project management, I summarized as prioritized requirements delivered. And for me, agile program management is about prioritized benefits delivered. And thereby hangs the key difference between the two things. Okay, we've got another question. How does this align with APM body of knowledge? Um, agile and change management are completely aligned with the APM's body of knowledge. Um, the APM Box 6, I'm sure many of you out there are familiar with it, uh, addresses both portfolio program and project management and recognizes the importance um, of team working, team development, team behaviors. It recognizes the importance of leadership in the context of delivering change projects and programs and the importance of a lot of the softer skills as well around things like negotiation, persuasion, conflict management and so forth. All essential qualities when it comes to leading change programs. So it is in complete alignment, um, and there's also not a huge overlap in a lot of the techniques in the body of knowledge 
will complement once more the agile program management approach and the change management techniques we've talked about today. Another question we have here, how many organizations have you worked with use specialist change managers and what are their success rates? Um, that's a great question, um, quite tricky to answer in the time we've got available, um, but I would just go alongside um, and say where people don't have change managers involved, there's one organization in particular that's trying to roll out at the moment that we're working with um, a great ERP solution. Um, and they're trying to do it in a sort of, um, I would call it a blanket bomb approach, where they, they put people through a process without really understanding the, 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 the changes they're bringing about for individuals concerned. So they're pushing the change into the organization without the organization receiving the change, pulling it. What that does is impose the change on people without change management skills in place. There's now a huge resistance building amongst the stakeholders in future phases to this program to the point where the program is beginning to struggle badly. Conversely, I've also worked in organizations where um, I worked in a startup. Um, I say it's a startup. It was the launch of three in the UK. And what that um, portfolio of programs had was a, was a complete culture aligned around the successful execution of the program and becoming first to market. First was everything in that context, and the culture within that organization um, meant that whatever problems and difficulties people had ended up as creative conflict, bringing about change within an organization. They had change managers um, across the piece who made sure that the setup and startup of the organization was sustainable and the benefits of introducing solutions and products into the organization um, was secured on an ongoing basis. So I would say that their um, success rate, because they did get first to the marketplace, was an awful lot higher than the first example I gave. Okay, another question that's just come in. What is the main difference between regular program management and agile program management? Um, agile program management um, fixes the time of which the program is trying to deliver, whereas um, regular program management, as, as you put it, has a more uh, versatile time frame attached to it. Similarly, agile tries to fix upon the costs associated with delivering the prioritized benefits. Um, agile projects, of course, are delivered um, in a time-boxed fashion using a range of different agile techniques to deliver the changes required, including things like Scrum and Kanban and so forth. But um, essentially the key difference for me is a prioritization of benefits, the, the time-boxing of the program, um, the budget fixing of the program, so just enough gets delivered when it's required and no more than that. I've seen lots of real programs um, where there's so much fluidity in the program, you get much more variability. Other key differences between some of, is with some of the roles that I've mentioned, specifically around the change agents, uh, the stakeholder engagement coordinator, the business change owners, and that alignment with people in terms of the structure of the agile program approach is far stronger than I've seen tr more traditional program approaches. So it's particularly important when bringing about change programs as opposed to some other types of specification driven programs. Okay, another question here. Does Agile make it difficult to know when a program has finished and entered BAU? Um, I think the short answer to that question is no. I think it's the opposite. Um, because Agile signals when a capability, capability has been delivered that will enable the realization of those benefits, um, and it's, it's fixed at a point in time, so you try and pin that point in time down. The expectation is set as to when the change will be brought about, so work can be done then to invest in the people side of bringing the change about and ensuring it's successful. Um, as with all programs, whether agile or not agile, the benefits resulting from a program of change are likely to continue to be on, be on the end of the program. So for me, you have to signal the precise point at which you have done enough of the agile change that's going to be brought about. Um, some programs I've seen that use a more traditional approach um, seem to want to con con consider and deliver everything set out in, in what may be termed a blueprint. Um, so basically, the, uh, the, the need for uh, delivering all of the changes uh, is often long forgotten in that context. And the other key dimension is the Moscow prioritization in an agile environment. Um, delivering um, all of the musts, the shoulds, and some of the coulds, and there's a point in time at which um, a decision is taken, well, that's the end of the program.
Okay, another question here. Is there a recommended toolkit for managing change in an agile environment? By toolkit, um, if you mean agile framework, then the agile program management framework is, is absolutely um, a, a good framework to use. But coupled with change management would make it an even more comprehensive framework. We've done a lot of work with organizations where you don't necessarily take one framework and apply it vanilla style. I'm sure many of you, for example, have had a go at some point trying to roll out methods such as PRINT2. Um, I've never met an organization that's rolled out everything in PRINT2 simply because you must adapt the methodology to suit the culture and prevailing governance within an organization. And you also then take different elements that suit the way your organization brings about change. So you might take elements from the APM's body of knowledge with some practical planning techniques, you take elements from the Agile Program Management Framework, um, elements of change management, and, and you do what works within your organization. Um, someone also asked me once on a change management course, was, was, was there some software for doing the change management? And if that's what you meant by the question, I apologize if I've misunderstood. But the whole business of change management um, is, is, doesn't involve software, it involves uh, the actual engagement and dealing with people. So I found um, the other person's question in that context somewhat bemusing. I hope that answers that question for you. Okay, one more question here. Um, any suggestions on how to work successfully across multiple sites, including offshore? Um, working across multiple sites, including offshore, um, brings an, another dimension, um, because clearly this is all about communication. Um, I'm a big fan of face-to-face -face communication because that way people build relationships. And one of the core tenets of agile ways of working is to build strong teams. Um, if you have a good empowerment taking place in the right culture across the organization, then once you've built that strong firm program foundation, um, with lots of face-to-face -face contact, you create the, the culture, the environment in which the program is going to be delivered. Then you, you can empower those teams to get on and deliver and plenty of regular communications through things like webinars, remote working, et cetera, et cetera, would be good. Lots of people have video conferencing as well. Um, to be able to have that, that interpersonal contact, including people's body language and faces, for me, that's always been terribly important when communicating with people, despite the fact I'm currently on a webinar with you all. Um, but it's a way of communicating across multiple sites, but the, it does present a different challenge. The other thing I would suggest is, is to try and get a change team that's even bigger and get local people within the um, international sites to actually work on the ground in those international contexts. We're working with a client at the moment, for example, um, who has somewhere, somewhere around about 100 sites in the five continents. Um, when they try and roll out a change across that organization, um, it does become very difficult unless you really invest an awful lot of time and money and effort and energy in setting the programs up right in the first place to then empower the local teams to bring about the change that may be centrally driven. That's upfront investment, continuous communication, proper empowerment, and then regular contact. Okay, and we're going to go to our final question now. Um, we do have so many questions coming in, but I'm just conscious of time. What we shall do is we shall circulate all of your questions um, to Chris, and I will ask him to respond to those individually. But our final question for today is, um, any suggestions for working successfully with internal partners who are working with a waterfall delivery? Um, I think that's about understanding the structure of the work that needs to be done for those particular programs and appreciating the differences between the two different styles of working. There are certain things that are appropriate to be delivered using an agile uh, approach, a number of techniques are available, as I'm sure you know, under an agile framework. Equally, there are other areas where an agile approach is, is less suitable and less suited and creates more confusion than the problems it's trying to solve. Um, an example would, would be a, a whole scale IT rollout where you might be rolling out um, infrastructure, cabling networks and all those sorts of things. Um, and in the context of an agile program, what you may then say is, okay, let's look at the benefits the program's trying to bring about. And then let's use those benefits and the prioritization of those benefits to bring about change and that network infrastructure in those areas that we have prioritized as bringing about the change first. So if you can align both the waterfall approach and the agile approach, to the benefits the program's trying to bring about, you'll start to create more harmony between those two ways of working. And then I think it's a question of those teams mutually respecting one another 
um, and, and understanding the approach that each is taking to get the work delivered. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time this afternoon and we do hope that you have um, a lovely afternoon. The um, the links to the slides and also the, um, the recording will be available and circulated this afternoon. Again, thank you very much and take care.